afternoon, it's 4 p.m. in Central Europe and it's Space Café Web Talk time. Our Space Café Web Talk 33 minutes with Graham Turner will begin very soon. Thank you for joining us for a talk today about the accelerators, ESA's plan to wrap, drive European space. This is edition number 114 today and it marks our last 33 minutes event before the summer break. So, a special event requires a special guest. As always, we appreciate your participation and your ongoing feedback. Spacewatch.global is a Europe-based online platform for information in and about space and new space activities in a geopolitical context. And I would like to thank all our private and corporate supporters that showed their commitment to keeping our independent journalism alive. We really appreciate that. I know many of you are already familiar with our website, our bi-weekly and daily newsletters and the Space Cafe podcast. The latest one featured Adrian Mordeur, an Aurora Hunter and Stargazer. Listen to it. We also have new exciting episodes in the Space Cafe radio every Monday, every Thursday for you. Also worth listening. We also keep our fan shop open online for you to support us actively and become a real space watcher. If you have missed any of our previous web talks, we have an archive available on our website in the event section and on YouTube. So, I met my guest today a few years back in Vienna at an SP Fall event. He gave a super impressive and engaging talk. Fast forward, when I researched on our topic today, I found that he is the man in charge of the accelerators. And with that, it is my great pleasure to welcome in our Space Cafe today, Graham Turnock. For the few people are that, does not, that do not know him, Graham has been a special advisor to the European Space Agency since 2021. And before that, he was chief executive of the UK Space Agency. He has almost 30 years of experience working in government and international organization, including in a number of posts are in the UK uh, senior civil service and on secondment to the European Commission and the French administration. He is an experienced board member in both the public and charitable uh, sectors, including currently as treasurer of the Youth Hostels Association of England and Wales and in the past as a non-executive director of the Met Office. He holds a PhD in particular physics from the Cambridge University for his theoretical work at CERN and a diploma in public administration from the École Nationale de Administration. I know it's completely wrong pronounced the INA in France. Outside of work, he is a keen cyclist. And that, again, welcome Graham to our Space Coffee Today, let's kick that off. Tell us a little bit more about yourself and what is your space journey or journey to space? So good morning, Torsten, and uh, hello, everyone who's watching today. It's really great to be here. Yeah, so my journey into space um, really began when I was very little. So I was born in uh, 1968, so a little bit too young to remember the moon landings, but I do remember some of the final Apollo missions, and I remember the uh, the moon sort of buggy as it was, and that was just so exciting. And then uh, a little bit after that, um, I was so madly excited about space that I wrote a book at the age of nine about a space detective. <laughs> so, wait, wait a second, uh, you, you wrote a book? Yeah, it's not published, I'm afraid, but okay. uh, it, was, it was like quite long. It was about 100 pages, and I think I've still got the manuscript somewhere. Wow. Uh, so that was like uh, in the late 1970s. Um, then, of course, the space shuttle came along, another very exciting period. I was a very active member of my local astronomy society in Leicester. I have to say I was about the only person under 40 <laughs> who joined it. And the fact that I stuck with it shows really how passionate I was. And I've always been someone that's liked to do different things. So then when I went to university, I thought I'll kind of do physics generally. I ended up in particle physics because that was where things were really happening uh, in the late 80s with, with CERN and the electron positron accelerator. Did a few other things, but then I just had to come back to space. It was my first love. And uh, so uh, there I was um, uh, five years ago in the UK Space Agency and now 
uh, even bigger and better here I am in the European Space Agency so I can't uh, I can't ask for more okay so <laughs> I I'm not sure if that correlates, but working with a CERN accelerator, I mean, that could also answer my, my next question. So how did you get to the accelerators in that case, or either accelerators? I mean, did, did Joseph just call you and ask for your help? How did it work? Yeah, so good question. Um, so the accelerators are really about um, trying to make better use of what space can offer to solve some of the world's biggest problems, climate change, you know, responding to climate emergencies and dealing with debris. And you know, one of the things that we've um, concluded on, we got some great advice from a group of you know, very senior people uh, about six months ago. One of the things we concluded was that we needed to bring space closer to the users. You know, a lot of uh, applications are still sort of institutionally developed and uh, not so easy to engage with and we needed to make the most of the burgeoning uh, private sector especially in the applications market and I mean those two things are very much part of my sort of focus at the UK Space Agency we've got the Centre for Applications at Exat in in uh, in the UK and we've always very much focused on supporting the private sector so I think Joseph thought I'd be a, a good person to uh, put at the helm of this uh, this program. Oh, so, so he he literally called you then and said, "Hey, or can you jump or on the board here and and run this accelerators for for us?" Yeah, it, it was certainly good timing. Yeah, I mean, I've I've been talking to him about coming to ESA uh, about a little bit over a year ago, okay. and then you know this um, uh, program of work with this high level advisory group was just um, coming to its conclusion as as we sort of agreed that I would come to ESA. And so I've then just sort of slotted progressively into this work. I think we didn't know quite where it was going initially. So I've really only been formally appointed to this role in the last month or two, but I've very much been working on, on the precursor activity over the last six months. Let's dive into the accelerators. I mean, we on spacewatch.global try to follow as, as close as possible. We started to report of them, I think since November last year when they are, were, were laid out. And but can you conceptualize those for us? So what does the accelerators mean before we then dig into them or one by one? Yeah, so essentially what we're saying is space has a huge amount to offer to um, solving some of the most sort of pressing problems that we face as a planet, you know, both on the Earth and, and in space with this huge um, emerging problem of uh, space debris if we don't do something about it. Um, but we're not really um, uh, doing as much as we could with space. Uh, there's a, quite a sort of enclosed space community, um, certainly within government, outside of dedicated space agencies. Other agencies don't necessarily even know when they're using space and don't necessarily appreciate the power of space to solve some of their problems. So we're saying um, we need a, a wider um, community of um, both public and private sector partners um, engaged um, with the opportunities that space has to offer and you know by doing that we can raise raise the game really we can make a much bigger contribution to tackling climate change and managing um, the impact of it you know be that uh, you know making uh, more efficient uh, use of water for farming uh, in areas that are, are struggling with water or be it responding to forest fire emergencies by giving you know frontline uh, first responders, you know, the information they need on the spot to make decisions. Are these pure ESA or European accelerators? Yeah, so we, we really want them to be European accelerators. So what we're saying is we in ESA are active on all three accelerators, um, but we think many more um, people could be doing um, something about this and we want to bring them together both the public sector and the private sector so we want to create these communities around the accelerators encourage um, sort of collective vision setting um, a certain amount of coordination and hopefully we you know, actually encourage people to do more than they would otherwise do and especially bring in some of these you know agencies like maritime agencies um, forestry agencies environmental agencies into the sort of space family and and get them infused with what we can do mm -hmm. i see i see when these the accelerators been announced and we again go by them or, or go through them one by one they sounded very nice 
very inspiring. But what is the current status? I mean, yeah. what is the, what is the meat on a bone? So, um, was it so, just, so? I mean, it could be, of course, a, a messaging for the media or European politicians. So, can you give us an update of these three things? Yeah, the certainly. Last, the last one is the our space for the green accelerator? Well, so we started with space for green future, then we sort of work out from the surface of the earth, if you like. So space for green future, rapid and resilient crisis response, and then protecting space assets. Um, so yeah, to give you some examples, I mean, in all of these areas, ESA is already active. So ESA is you know, developing its own contributions to these accelerators, and there's been some really good progress on that over the last a few months, but I suppose maybe what um, is most sort of relevant to the accelerators is where we started to engage with other partners. So, I mean, let me actually take Protect, which is you know trying to address these questions around debris and space traffic management, et cetera. Um, there, one of the big steps forward that we've made is really getting a much better dialogue over the last six months with the European Commission. So. I mean, previously, um, this is perhaps a little bit of a caricature, but you know, we had ESA over here doing what it was doing on technology and standards, and then the European Commission over here working with the EU Space Surveillance and Tracking Consortium, uh, doing you know almost completely different stuff, and there wasn't much of a dialogue between the two. And one of the things this might sound a bit administrative that we've done over the last few months is that we've actually developed an understanding, so a sort of joint um, declaration on how we're going to work together in that sphere and we're having um, regular engagement with the European Commission and it's yeah, it's helping firm up ESA's own proposals for space safety for the ministerial that's happening in November um, and uh, the uh, Commission are very grateful for our um, interest and support to their proposals for space traffic management which they just brought out in February so we're working with them to say well what technology do we need to actually make space traffic management work and how can ESA help with that so there's a real dynamic starting to get going on this one I see but I mean you're talking here with the German so I like it structured so I don't leave yeah. you off the hook to talk about the space for the green future uh, yes so what what is the uh, really what what is the status what is the, the, the yeah. first results give us something concrete yeah. yeah, so um, Space for Green Future, um, one of the big ideas there is to create these green information factories. So, um, as I said before, we've got all this wonderful space data, but is it really helping people make decisions? Um, uh, not as much as it could do. And one of the things that, that we proposed is that we create um, across Europe a series of, of sort of, you know, centres of um, data where we're not just putting it all in a sort of computer, but we're actually making it really easy to engage with for you know, businesses or civil society. And we are currently talking to um, uh, three, I mean, I won't name them because you know, the discussions are ongoing, but three countries about creating green information factories. So we really hope to have uh, announcements on that um, you know, over the next uh, few months. But when, when you talk about Earth observation data here for for the yes. uh, for the first accelerator. I mean, we have a European program in place. Uh, it's considered to be the best in the world. So Copernicus. So isn't that enough? Well, I don't think. Or, it can or ever where, be where do we define the gap? So. Well, so I mean, that's a good question. So you know, one of the things that we need to do is make sure that we are identifying gaps. But for example, we had a very useful series of uh, user workshops back at the end of, of January, where we said to users, you know, is there a gap between what you've got today and, and what you need? And, and the answer came back loud and clear, absolutely, there's a gap. You know, it's great that we've got this data, but it needs to be made more specific to the, the you know, decisions that we have to take. And you know, we can't rely fully on um, the Copernicus to develop all the applications. So you know, one of the questions is trying to create that sort of, just as we see on the internet more generally, you know, with things like Apple and, and Android, we see sort of you know, application developers. We really need to create this environment where there are very active application developers looking to use space data. We need to overcome some of the standardization issues that perhaps get in the way of pulling together different data sets. So you know, these green information factories would be sort of hot houses 
where we encourage this kind of application development and we bring users closer to the data. So, yeah, there was a very clear message that, that this was needed. Of course, you know, if you spend forever kind of trying to sort of, you know, carve up the sort of uh, requirement set and proving beyond all possible doubts that there's, uh, you know, a gap there, we'd probably still be here in five years time. So, you know, we will, we will be piloting these approaches. So part of the answer to your question around gap analysis is that you pilot the green information factories and then you learn from that where the gap is so sometimes it's about learning by doing not just about sort of endless bits of paper and analysis I'm, I'm still miss something here because or don't get it right potentially you have the either business incubators huge program rolled out or across these european countries we have the, the OISPA going out with hackathons, accelerators, and, and so on. So we are fostering also on the national level are the, the, the startups, the, the new space companies. And so far, I would say 60% are doing downstream data analytics and, and applications, as you said. So how is that, is that connected to the accelerators? Yeah, so I mean, obviously, we're not going to try and just create a completely new layer over, over existing layers. Um, uh, you, as you say, there's there's a number of networks already. Um, but um, I mean, you know, there is definitely a demand for a lot more here. I mean, we're hearing that uh, the insurance markets, you know, would like to be able to use uh, space data to, um, you know, help create sort of products which uh, support for example, farmers who need to insure against, uh, you know, periods of drought where their um, crops are going to reduce. Um, so, um, you know, you can take sort of two approaches to this. You can say if there's a sort of um, a message that we're not doing enough, then we simply need to work harder on what we're doing already. Or you can say, well, maybe we should try something transversal uh, and, and come across it, uh, you know, from a different direction and see whether that fills the gap. And I think we should be trying to do both. I don't think we've got too many initiatives at the moment. And what we're talking about here is a, a limited number of pilots in the first instance. Okay. Um, so as I say, let, let's just do this. You know, we're hearing that we're not doing enough and it's not necessarily always the answer just to do more of the same or just try and expand along the current lines when you hear that we're not doing enough. So we're gonna give it a go. This is, I'm afraid my perspective on this is a little bit more British than yours. <laughs> tend to be a little bit more, uh, you know, obviously the German approach is we need to plan this out, think it through, analyze the gaps. British approach is let's experiment. You know, If we hear that we're not doing enough, maybe we should take a different angle at it and see how that uh, works out. I got it, I got it. Okay, second accelerator is as you mentioned before a rapid and resilient crisis response or where do we stand and i think it's it's very topical these days yeah so i mean this is uh, this is less kind of well there clearly is a gap at the moment um because um you know res first responders are getting data but they're often getting data sort of 24 hours after the event you know just because of the revisit time uh, of, uh, you know, of Earth observation satellites at the moment. So, you know, there's clearly an opportunity for improvement in the way in which data gets to um, crisis responders. Um, and that will, you know, th that will come simply through the advent of these you know, new constellations that are planned, such as the Italian Earth observation constellation, which East is going to help uh, Italy build. Um, but beyond that, what we're seeing is, you know, a number of sort of discrete um, emergency data services um, and an opportunity really to federate those and pull them together and then again make them um, more user friendly um, for uh, services on the front line. So we've got emergency, uh, Copernicus Emergency Management Service, uh, we've got Galileo um, Warning Services. Um, but if you're a user, you, it's sort of down to you to sort of take these services and somehow try and integrate them and, um, you know, factor them into your decision making. And again, to take the analogy of, of what's happening in the sort of application world more generally, what we're saying is let's create an operating system, a sort of an Android or, you know, mm -hmm. uh, a, a, an Apple for the emergency um, uh, sector, whereby we make all of these input capabilities interoperable 
And then we encourage application developers to come forward and provide applications to crisis responders. So we're bringing the private sector in to that space at the moment, which, um, which they are sort of um, involved in, but they, they're not really sort of welcomed into in our view. And this would you know, really create a sort of, uh, a sort of very welcoming environment um, where they had all the tools to deliver these services. It'll take a while to deliver. Um, you know, but we're starting off with something called the Civil Space for Civil, uh, Civil Security um, a program, which is um, proposed for the ministerial uh, in November. And then we'd look to sort of build on that and work with the European Commission and the Copernicus and Galileo services to produce this sort of federated system over the next you know, five to 10 years. I like, I, I, I sh like the, the sh sheer idea of an ESA OS so as you said, you create an own operating system for, for, for that. So this middle, but practical question, did, did the Ukraine war and are not just the military or, um, side, but also the, the civil disaster pushed the need for this kind of accelerators, programs, solutions? No, definitely. And just to pick up on what you just said, I mean, we don't necessarily see it as an ESA system. Again, we're proposing it. Um, but we don't see ourselves as operating it. Um, we also see ourselves as supporting development. So, yeah, no, Ukraine has shone a very clear spotlight on this issue. And, um, you know, we're seeing how you know, satellite data is incredibly important when you're trying to sort of support the migration of refugees. You know, you can easily, you know, easily see how many people are stuck at the border just by looking down. Mm -hmm. You can um, monitor what's happening with crops. You know, are they, are they perhaps not being harvested? You can see that very easily. Um, and obviously, you know, this is not really ESA's area, but you know, clearly uh, satellite data is being used in, in the conflict itself. And indeed, you know, satellites being targeted as part of the conflict, you know, we had the case of the Viasat satellite, which was you know, clearly knocked out by Russian activity uh, very early on in the, in, the, in the conflict. So I think it has made people much, much more aware of you know, the power and the vul vulnerability of uh, space systems. Yeah. But is, is ESA flirting with the dark side? I mean, you, you never, dark side, the military side, you, you never, or ESA, it's not mandated, as far as I know, to or take on any military or defense or task. But it sounds that that this panel might swing back and forth. And so on, um, on the ma on the mass media, and again, what do we see? Is in the mass media we see max up pictures all over every day, yeah, and all on all news shows. So it's hardly to to find. A Copernicus picture from from the from the situation describing the situation. So, still, yeah. Well, I mean, I think um, so. The, the what we often see with the um, the private sector capability is is the ability to sort of focus in and you know look at specific uh, uh, you know targeted sort of shots. I mean, the Copernicus um, a system, as we know, sort of takes a sort of wider swath and sort of generally covers the entire surface of the earth. Uh, and quite often what people are doing in the private sector is they're using the Copernicus data to then queue their sort of private sector assets, which are, you know, more focused, but need that wider field of view of the Copernicus uh, data set in order to actually decide where to look. But in terms of your question about ESA, no, we're not getting into, you know, uh, you know operational sort of military stuff. That's not really our... Uh, area, we are required to focus our efforts on peaceful purposes. Um, but peaceful purposes doesn't um, exclude, you know, being concerned about security issues, uh, such as, you know, cyber vulnerability. Um, so, you know, there's, a, and that's clearly a very sort of big issue at the moment. And we're working with the European Commission on their proposals for um, a secure communications uh, constellation. The last one, and for me, the most important one, if I have to choose one, is protecting our off space assets, because without protection, everything we talked about might be might be gone or within, yeah, within Kessler. So 
Um, but what is the, the, the current status here? Um, can you give us an update on protection of space assets? I mean, you alluded to it a bit earlier, Juliet, also, uh, already. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, as I say, I think, you know, the, the really, there's two sort of really exciting aspects to this. So one is, um, you know, heading for a, a zero debris um, future. And that's something that ESA is you know, committed to. So you know, what does that mean? It means you know, making sure that spacecraft um, absolutely do deorbit. Um, uh, obviously, geo is a different uh, matter, but certainly in low Earth orbits, um, you know, deorbit at the end of life and deorbit effectively and quickly. Um, uh, it's about um, you know, building into satellites um, uh, sort of you know, defensive capabilities that really reduce the risk of collision. You know, down to the absolute minimum, um, uh, making sure that they are harder themselves in the sense of, you know, the very, very tiny bits of debris um, withstanding, you know, hits from uh, pieces of, of metal that you can't uh, actually avoid. Um, and, um, you know, that, that and then obviously uh, things like uh, the Astroscale um, uh, mission to you know, bring down you know, potentially very um, uh, you know, problematic large bits of debris that, uh, that we should try and get out of orbit um, because of their potential to you know, fragment, which is you know, the biggest risk. So there's all that technical stuff, which ESA is already very active on. But then, as I say, the other sort of element is um, this push towards space traffic management, um, which is not our responsibility, but where we feel we can absolutely help with the technical underpinning that's required. So space traffic management will need the application of, of standards and those will be technical standards. So, you know, there will be quite, you know, issues such as, you know, how rapidly should you be able to um, uh, deorbit, um, especially, you know, satellites that fail, you know, what should be the standards around um, deorbiting? Do you use a grappling system? Do you use some kind of magnetic plate? Um, so all of those things, ESA has already been very active on. And what, what's really happened over the last six months is we've got this really good dialogue going with the European Commission and ESA, which uh, you know, just wasn't there really before. And that was a huge missed opportunity for Europe. Uh, you mentioned space traffic management, and that's something what we, again, follow very closely. Where do you see that space traffic management for, for Europe might be located, and I know it's a it's a difficult question. Well, when you say located, you mean physically? No, located in the organization of you know, of, of Europe. So I mean, yes, we have EU SST, we have OISPA, we have the EU and yeah. itself. So we have uh, action services, we have EDA, we have yeah. Well, I think I mean organization. I think... Yeah, so I mean, I think the um, European Union's space traffic management communication is sort of fairly clear that it wants to take this forward in a collaborative way with member states because you know the competence is is fundamentally with member states currently but the european union is saying how does one align uh, the position of of the european member states on regulation and you know postulating that that alignment is essential if europe then wants to take a a strong role in in global moves towards um, uh, space traffic management so I mean, I think that's not, you know, I don't think ESA sees a role in that sort of rules setting, you know, other than as a technical advisor, but we definitely see our um, contribution to um, supporting the technical um, requirements that will underpin space traffic management. Okay, so we have now our end of June, or so first half of, um, of 2022 is over. How good are we? How good is ESA in this process? So are you satisfied what you achieved? Are you on track? Or have there been any major pushbacks? I mean, of course, we have one crisis is, uh, is coming after the other. And now COVID is back, what we thought it's, it's gone and whatever. So it's, do you see pushbacks? Or are you on track? Well, I think what's really heartening is that it's not just ESA talking about the accelerators. You know, people are coming to us and saying, this is great. This is what we've been asking for for a long time. You know, we're on board. And we're already starting to see that common language being used, which means that uh, some of the partnerships that we're talking about are, 
I think are starting to happen without even the need for ESA to be going out and sort of organizing seminars or, or, or sort of calling meetings. And I think really that will be the success of the accelerators. Um, it's not going to be a sort of traditional program uh, of the sort that he says sort of run in the past where we ask member states for money and then we sort of set up a team and we, uh, you know, commission industry to do things. This is almost like a kind of, you know, a call to arms. It's a, it's a campaign. Um, and so uh, as much as anything, I want to be doing exactly what we're doing today, which is talking about it and encouraging other people to say, okay, how can I act in a way that's consistent with the accelerators? Um, I don't even need to necessarily talk to ESA about it. You know, if I'm okay. a private sector operator, I go to uh, I go to the Environment Agency in the Netherlands and I say, look, you know, we're on board with this concept of acceleration. You know, how can we help? So um, that's that's what this is about as much as anything. It's creating this community of people who actually act on their own initiative. So ESA is obviously here. I'm I'm here and I'm keen to make things happen but as of course you've you've implied you know um big organizations tend to move a little bit slowly at first so at the moment i'm i'm the first and only uh, full-time appointee on the accelerators with anisa and we're building up a team here um, but as i say that that's why we mustn't make this just sort of dependent on you know don't do anything until lisa comes to you we want to you know see people talking and doing uh, uh the accelerators under their own initiative and I definitely see stuff happening over the next six months, as I've just talked to you about, you know, making good progress with the European Commission on Protect, but on green future, let's all start talking and doing it. But one, one question on, on, on that. You said people are companies coming, coming to you or going to the environmental agencies and saying we, we are on board. Is it this kind of we are taking care of sustainability and want to put something in or is it just another form of calling for money well i think it's both isn't it i mean you know there's there's a virtuous circle here mm -hmm. um we see that space is underutilized that's one of the things this high level advisory group said they said you know space is underutilized it's not really pulling its weight there are there are some really big societal challenges that space can help with and also, you know, we need, if we are to be competitive on the global stage as the European space sector, we need to grow the size of the European space sector. We don't spend the sorts of money the United States do on defence space, so we don't have that kind of, um, you know, drive. We have got ESA, but I mean, its budget is much smaller on things like exploration than NASA's. So we need to sort of, um, you know, come up with uh, the European answer, which is, you know, and I said, yeah, this is very much my background, you know, driving, you know, the private sector and also looking to non-traditional space departments to, to, to see the opportunities. So, so this is a, a, a virtuous circle. It's about space doing more for others and then that helping the space sector grow and be more effective in itself. Talking about budgets, your boss are, is not quite in addressing very, very direct what he expects later this year in the ministerial conference from the member states. So, but what can we expect in terms of the accelerators until then? Any major milestones you, you see in, in summer or is it just campaigning for the ministerial then? So, um, I mean, ESA's a big focus is the ministerial now, absolutely. And I don't want people to think that we are sort of, you know, distracted by the accelerators. Um, I mean, there was a big focus. Um, uh, the accelerators are now established. They'll continue to be a focus for the organization. Um, but the top of the office is very much focused on the ministerial. Um, so Joseph is rightly, you know, totally uh, focused on that over the next six months and obviously dealing with the consequences of the Ukraine crisis. Um, in terms of the accelerators, though, as I mentioned, we're doing things like developing these green information factory pilots. So um, I think people can expect to hear things uh, about those in, in the next six months. Absolutely. And, you know, one thing that I want us to do is to maintain this momentum of um, engagement, user engagement, which is why I was so pleased to come here today. But this is sort of one of a series of things that I want us to be doing over the next six months. So building this community making it a real living community. Perfect. I mean, we have 
a number of more formats we can offer to you, our podcasts, our radio. So whenever you have the desire to, to speak to a larger global audience, hey, reach out to us. We are here. So that's, Thank you. that's great. And maybe next time we also speak about the Mars, what you, what you have behind you. So our... I mean, I think it's one of the inspirators that that or that ESA has. So, and but I think the focus was good set on the accelerator. Thank you very much, Earl Graham, for your time. It was a great pleasure. And now handing back to Chiara. So, did you like it? I are, are you excited now about the accelerators? I definitely am. Yes, uh, it was very informative. So, thank you so much for this, Graham. I do also have to admit, I'm still quite curious about your book and about the space detective as well. <laughs> I'm going to have to try and dig it out. So uh, <laughs> I'll look for it. It's probably I mean, under the bed somewhere. <laughs> now, now, as you start with it, I found or in, in the apartment of my mom an old drawing from from me from where I was very little in the kindergarten with the old Soyuz station and with cosmonauts. And and so in Spain said, wow. There were first signs that I'm doing something in space. So, um, um, exactly. Yeah. See, this is perfect grounds for collaboration. We have the author and the illustrator here. There we are. There we are. I, we'll I let, wouldn't we'll call myself together, an also. illustrator. <laughs> That's, um, th there's a gap. I mean, I, I my career choose another way. <laughs> <laughs> Kara, over to you. Perfect. This was a really nice way to kick off our summer break for the 33 minutes. But fret not, we have plenty more space cafes coming up in July. So on the 6th of July, we'll have our next space arbitration event by Laura Zelensky, who will be discussing the question with her guests of can we arbitrate space collision cases? Then on the 12th of July, we'll have our first edition of the Space Cafe Israel by Mayded Pariente with his guest Tal Inba on the subject of Israel, from startup nation to space up nation. Then on the 27th of July, we'll have our next Space Cafe Italy by the wonderful Dr. Emma Gatti, who will be talking with Cinzia Sufada. And just a day later on the 28th, we'll have our next Space Law Breakfast with Stephen Freeland and his guests. Annie Hanmer and Chris Johnson. And this time we will be starting at 12.30 p.m. CEST for our American friends and also for us. <laughs> All events are going to be online on Eventbrite. And as always, we love to hear your feedback. So please check in with us on Twitter, Facebook and LinkedIn. Don't forget to sign up for our daily and our biweekly newsletters. And if you want to treat yourselves to something special, become a Space Watcher today or help us out in the supporter program. Again, huge thank you to Graham for this very inspiring and informative talk and for being our guest. And thanks again to the entire team behind the scenes for doing this great job week in and week out. I hope that you all stay safe and stay healthy. Hope to see you in the next time. Thank you for joining us. And in the meantime, visit our website and follow us on social media. And don't forget, become a Space Watcher. Thank you.